Even when the life of stars is very long compared to human lifetimes and human history, stars do not live forever. Instead, they transit through a series of stages and eventually die. In this video, we will discuss what are the life stages of stars of various masses, what happens to main sequence stars as they exhaust the hydrogen in their core, and how new chemical elements are created in the interiors of stars. A way to characterize the observable properties of stars is by plotting a hertzsprung russell diagram, often abbreviated as an HR diagram. An HR diagram plots the luminosity of stars on the vertical axis and their surface temperature on the horizontal axis. Luminosity increases upwards while temperature increases to the left. When the luminosity and surface temperature of many stars in the solar neighborhood are plotted on a HR diagram, most stars are aligned along a diagonal band running from highly luminous hot stars on the top right toward cool, less luminous stars on the bottom left. This band is called the main sequence. The models of stellar formation and evolution indicate that when a star is formed, it takes its place at one spot in the main sequence at a location that depends on the star's initial mass. The stars with larger mass are located higher in the main sequence, while low mass stars are located in the lower portion. In populations of stars with similar chemical composition, such as clusters of stars, Newly formed stars are located at the left border of the main sequence along a continuous line known as the zero-age main sequence. Stars along the zero-age main sequence recently began to fuse hydrogen in their core. Remember that stars produce energy by fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium atoms. In a simplified scheme, this process starts with four nucleus of hydrogen that contain only one proton each. They interact through a sequence of reactions, and the final outcome is an atom of helium with two protons and two neutrons, and an amount of energy emitted as gamma rays. Hydrogen fusion into helium takes place only in the central region of a star, where temperature and pressure are high enough. For this reason, the chemical composition of the stars gradually changes only in the central region. Hydrogen is gradually depleted while helium accumulates. The chemical composition of the rest of the star remains essentially intact, with approximately 92% of hydrogen atoms, 8% of helium atoms, and less than 1% of heavier elements. Theoretical models show that the change in composition of the stellar core has an impact on the whole structure of the star. As helium accumulates in the inner region, the temperature rises and this increases the rate of nuclear reactions and the luminosity of the star. As those changes take place, the star moves away from the zero-age main sequence to a slightly higher location in the HR diagram. All these changes are small and stars remain within the main sequence for most of their lifetime. The lifetime of a star in the main sequence depends on its mass. Contrary to what intuition might suggest, more massive stars will remain a shorter time in the main sequence, while less massive stars will remain a longer time. The reason is that more massive stars put more weight on the layers overlying the core, and to balance this weight, the pressure on the core must increase, which in turn increases the temperature of the core. Since the rate of nuclear reactions increases quickly with temperature, the star raises faster its storage of central hydrogen. The more massive stars in the main sequence spend their hydrogen resources at an astounding rate. The diagram shows the dependence of the main sequence lifetimes on spectral type and mass of the star. Our Sun is a G2 star with a lifetime of approximately 9 billion years. Because it formed approximately 4.5 billion years ago, the Sun is expected to stay in the main sequence another 4.5 billion years. For comparison, an O5 blue giant star has a lifetime of only 10 million years, about a 10,000th of the lifetime of the Sun. 
From this point in the life of stars, the future evolution depends on their mass. We will separate stars in three groups. Low mass stars, stars born with less than two solar masses. Intermediate stars, which are stars born with masses between two and eight solar masses. And high mass stars, stars born with masses greater than eight solar masses. Let's follow the evolution of low mass stars, those that were born with less than two solar masses. After continuous hydrogen burning in their core, the star eventually will use all its core hydrogen and the core will contain mostly helium. At that point, energy cannot be generated by hydrogen fusion because all of it is gone and the temperature in the core is not high enough to begin fusing helium. Without a source of energy, the long period of stability of the star comes to an end. Gravity takes over and the core contracts. As the core shrinks, the gravitational energy of the infalling material is converted to heat. The produced heat propagates outward, increasing the temperature of the core and surrounding hydrogen of the star. A shell of hydrogen just above the nucleus becomes hot enough for hydrogen fusion to begin. The star now has a core of inert helium surrounded by a shell of burning hydrogen and a stellar envelope of inert hydrogen. As the helium core continues to contract and transfer heat around it, the fusion rate in the surrounding hydrogen shell intensifies. The star quickly reaches a rate of energy production higher than that reached when the energy was produced by hydrogen fusion at the core. The excess of energy flow increases the luminosity of the star and expands its outer layers. The star grows, reaching enormous proportions, a few hundred times the size of the sun. Since gases in expansion cool down, the temperature of the expanding outer layers drops, and the star becomes redder. If we follow this evolution in the HR diagram, as the star becomes more luminous and cooler, it leaves the main sequence upward and to the right in the HR diagram and becomes a red giant. Red giants can become so large that if we were to place one at the center of the solar system, its atmosphere would extend to the orbit of Mars or beyond. As the core contracts, its temperature finally reaches 100 million Kelvin. At that high temperature, helium starts fusing into a process known as the triple alpha process. Three helium atoms collide and fuse into one carbon atom, releasing energy in this process. The energy released increases the temperature of the star core and quickly intensifies the rate of nuclear reactions. This blast of helium fusion is called the helium flash. The structure of the star at this stage consists of a core with helium fusion surrounded by a shell of fusing hydrogen and an upper layer of inert hydrogen. Once energy is produced by helium fusion in the core, a state of equilibrium similar to that characterized by the main sequence stage is reached. The production of energy falls from the peak reach during the red giant stage. Luminosity of the star is reduced, the outer layer contracts somewhat, and the surface temperature increases, turning the star's color back to yellow from red. In the HR diagram, the star will move downward and to the left of the red giant position. Carbon produced from helium accumulates in the stellar core. Soon, all the helium that is hot enough will be depleted in the inner region of the core, and the production of energy in the core comes to a halt. With the source of energy shut off, gravity takes over again and the core begins a second stage of collapse. Heat released by the contraction flows to the layers of helium above the core until helium is hot enough for fusion to begin in a shell surrounding the core that creates a new flow of energy. This situation is analogous to the end of the main sequence stage, but now the structure of the star is somewhat more intricate. The inert carbon core 
is surrounded by an active shell with helium fusion, surrounded by a shell of inert helium. Farther out, there is a shell of fusing hydrogen, and finally, the extended outer layer of inert hydrogen. The energy from the two active shells flows to the outer layers that begin a second period of expansion. Back to the red giant domain on the HR diagram, the star moves up and to the right. This will be a brief and final burst of glory of the star. Remember that the first time that the star had an inert core of helium, helium fusion saved the situation when the central temperature reached 100 million Kelvin. Now, with a carbon core, triggering the fusion of carbon would require a minimum temperature of 600 million Kelvin. The gravity from low mass stars cannot compress their core enough to reach such high temperatures and no further fusion is possible. The star is now close to its death. When stars are in the red giant stages, the expanded outer layers have a weaker tie to the star's gravity. Events like stellar pulsations and the helium flash can drive atoms in the outer atmosphere away from the star creating a shell of expanding material. On later stages, the strong ultraviolet radiation produced by the contracting carbon core will ionize the material of the expanding shell, making it glow brightly as a planetary nebula. Despite their misleading name, planetary nebula are not related to the planets. Their name is derived from the historical fact that some of these objects look circular when observed through small telescopes, bearing some resemblance to the planets. Let's now move to the evolution of medium and high mass stars, that is, stars that form with two or more solar masses. Those stars are located in the higher region of the main sequence. Medium and high mass stars have similar evolutionary stages until the very end of their lives, so we start this discussion considering them in a single group. We return to the point where stars began to leave the main sequence, with a core accumulating helium as the outcome of hydrogen fusion. The higher weight of these stars compress the hydrogen core to a higher temperature activating fusion processes that add to the triple alpha cycle operating in low mass stars. One of these fusion cycles is the CNO cycle that in a sequence smashes hydrogen nuclei into a carbon nucleus forming heavier elements. The CNO cycle begins with a nucleus of carbon being hit by a hydrogen atom and producing a nitrogen-13 isotope. This atom is unstable and after one of its protons decays into a neutron, the atom becomes a carbon-13 isotope. This isotope fuses sequentially with the second and third hydrogen atoms to form a nitrogen-14 and an oxygen-15 nucleus respectively. Oxygen-15 is unstable and decays into a nitrogen-15 after one of its protons is converted into a neutron. Finally, a fourth fusion with hydrogen forms a core of carbon-12 and a core of helium. The total outcome is one core of helium that accumulates in the stellar core, a nucleus of carbon ready to start over the cycle and produce more helium, and an amount of energy released in each of these steps involved that helps the star to keep the gas pressure required to avoid the gravitational contraction. The addition of a variety of fusion cycles speeds up the consumption of fuel available in the stars and shortens all their stages of evolution. The core will be depleted of hydrogen and will be composed mostly of helium in a period of time that is shorter for more massive stars. The main sequence stage that has a duration of 9 billion years for a solar mass star will be reduced to about 200 million years for a four solar masses star and to only 9 million years for a 20 solar masses star. In a chain of events that resembles those that happen with low mass stars, 
after the supply of hydrogen available in the core is depleted, the star goes through a series of instability stages that as a result form a core structure composed of an inner carbon core surrounded by a shell of fusing helium, a shell of inert helium, a shell of fusing hydrogen, and an upper layer of inert hydrogen. The periods of contraction of the core that ignite fusion in the hydrogen and helium shells come with an intense production of energy that expands the upper layers of the star that will begin cycles of red giant stages. Intermediate and high mass stars become so large that they are called red supergiants. Supergiant stars can become as large as the orbit of Jupiter. Betelgeuse is one of the supergiants closest to the Earth. Observations of the Hubble telescope using ultraviolet light capture some detail of its surface. This was the first direct image ever obtained of the surface of a star other than the Sun. The image shows a hot bright spot on the surface of the star about twice the diameter of the Earth's orbit. When helium available for fusion is depleted and the inert helium core is formed, the fate of intermediate and high mass stars diverges. Intermediate mass stars will never reach central temperatures needed to fuse carbon. These stars eventually throw away their upper layers and finish their lives as white dwarfs. In contrast to low and intermediate mass stars, high mass stars formed with about 8 solar masses or more will have no problem reaching the temperature of 600 million Kelvin required to start fusing carbon in their cores. Carbon produces oxygen that at still higher temperatures will fuse into heavier elements. Similar cycles repeat, each of them creating a core of a heavier element such as neon, magnesium and silicon. The star develops a chemical structure that resembles the layer of an onion, with fusions of a variety of elements which are heavier in layers closer to the center of the star. Iron, however, is the endpoint of this cyclic process. The reason for that is that fusion of iron does not generate energy and rather requires a source of energy to happen. Remember that in previous stages, fusion of hydrogen or helium produced the energy required to keep the temperature and gas pressure that resist the weight of the upper layers and avoid the collapse of the star. Since once the stellar core turns into iron, it's unable to generate further energy, the ultimate catastrophe approaches. The star will explode into a supernova, scattering all the newly made elements into space. Elements heavier than iron can be synthesized in the violence of that explosion, but that will be the topic of other study materials. The theories of stellar evolution and nucleosynthesis inside stars correctly predict the relative abundances of the chemical elements found in nature. They successfully explain how and where the elements that we commonly find on Earth and that are the base of life were formed.